Welcome back to another Vintage Matchbox Catalog. Today we're going all the way back to 1966 to take a gander at what was on offer from our favorite British toy manufacturer. I decided to take a different path to creating the videos this time and scan the pages in. This way everything stays nice and still, and I can also clean up the colors for a better viewing experience. I will also be sticking around for this video instead of just throwing on music, and I'll also be showing off some of the models here and there, just so you can see them outside of the catalog. Alright, let's get started. The first page gives us the Matchbox origin story. You can pause and read through it if you like. I'll expand a little bit from what is given here. Most people agree that this is the beginning of the Matchbox story. The Coronation Coach was extremely popular, and they did sell over a million of them. This success did push the three co-owners to continue to make die-cast toys. Now, previously Leslie had been making other non-toy die-cast items, but none were the success of this coach. And it was at this point that they decided to become a toy manufacturer. As far as the Matchbox concept of making the toys small enough to fit inside the Matchbox of the time, well, there's a bit of mythology here. First, they were not the first to do this. A German company actually had been making Matchbox toys for some time. These were small die-cast toys that would fit and were sold in Matchboxes. The story goes that Jack O'Dell, one of the co-owners of Lesney, his daughter wanted to take toys to school, but the school had a rule that the toy had to fit inside a matchbox for the child to bring it in. Jack wanted to please his daughter, and so he created a small die-cast road roller that would fit. And this toy so pleased the other kids that making these toys for the general public seemed like a win-win. A lot of people, myself included, think this is nothing but mythology a cute story to warm your heart to a brand. The dies for making die-cast toys are not cheap to make, then or now. The idea that Jack would spend a significant amount of time and money to produce one small toy for his daughter just so she could take it to school, well, it just sort of breaks credulity for me. But I will say it's a heartwarming story. Besides making great die-cast toys, Leslie also excelled at marketing toys to kids. You need look no further than the fact that these catalogs still exist today, over 50 years later, to see that. What's the oldest Target or Walmart catalog you own? So the fact that they might produce a few stories here and there is no surprise. So moving on, we begin to the Matchbox series. You can see the first item is a road roller. Again, paying tribute to the original Matchbox toy Jack made. This, however, is not the first version of this toy. The first version looked like this. This road roller is a reproduction of the original toy that Jack might have made for his daughter. It's quite a bit smaller than the 164 scale that Leslie produced later. I'm not sure if this is because matchboxes of the time got bigger, or if they just decided to standardize on the 164 scale and make boxes big enough to fit them. I'm going to guess the latter. Anyway, you can see that the artwork on this first page is just excellent. Nice and colorful, and is no doubt intended to get the imagination pumping of kids of the time. Every vehicle you see in any of these pictures is a car that you could buy, and they wasted no space in jamming as many in the image as they could. Here you can see the remainder of the first 12 cars. Again, nice bright colorful drawn images of the vehicles. You might also notice that they have a good mix of vehicles. Some cars, some work vehicles, emergency vehicles, motorcycles. I feel like this was done on purpose. It makes you search through all the cars in the catalog compared to if you had just stuck all of the vehicles of one type together. I'm sure the hope was that you might come across some other vehicle you might want while you were looking for that tractor for your imaginary farm. I will note that the number eight Caterpillar tractor is extremely hard to find with the original treads. The rubber hardens over the years and becomes extremely brittle and the plastic hook on the jumbo crane can be missing or mangled on most models you find today. Looking through 13 to 29, I'll point out that number 13 and number 25 both are British petroleum badge and colored vehicles. I don't know if Lesney paid to use the badge or if BP paid them to put it on. I haven't found any information regarding the Lesney BP connection. Obviously, BP is based in the UK, so no surprise Lesney would use real UK companies on their vehicles. The only vehicle here I don't own is the number 14 ambulance, and that seems to be rather rare. I've yet to come across it. Finishing off the first 29 cars, you can see our first trailer, number 23. Matchbox cars, unlike Hot Wheels that would be coming out in a few years, were not built for speed. They were built more for imaginary play, so a lot of cars came with tow hooks, 
and the child could put on any number of trailers that Matchbox made. The child could then push around the car with the trailer in tow. This would be abandoned in later years as Lesney switched over to the Superfast line to compete with Mattel. Much later, both companies would reincorporate these options into their toys, but never to the extent that they did during this time. Moving on to the cars number 30 through 41, we can see yet another colorful piece of artwork showing off the then very new GT40, the subject of a pretty good movie that came out this year. Of note here is the number 30, the eight-wheel crane. I feel like this is one of the easiest matchbox vehicles to find. It's rare that I don't find one at a flea market or other places vintage matchbox are sold. They can usually be had for as cheap as a dollar. Looking at the next page, you can see that the two race cars shown in the art are prominently displayed for purchase. Here I'll assume they did not want kids to want to search too far for these. Since we're on the subject of the GT40, I thought I would show you one of those. This is a great model of the Ford GT. It has real rubber tires and a silver engine you can see behind the rear glass. This is one of those models that can go for quite a bit due to Matchbox collectors and Ford race car collectors snatching them up. Luckily, Leslie did make quite a few of them, so your chances of getting one are pretty good. Okay, moving on to 42 through 58, you can see we have our first boat in the series. I don't have this boat yet, but it's not too difficult to find. For this page, I thought I would show off the ice cream truck. This is a good example of a vehicle that has a person molded into it. This is something Lesney would do often at this time, but would abandon in later years with Mattel almost never doing it. I think this has to do with scale. Most vehicles are said to be in 164 scale, but this is usually only in cars and small trucks. Other vehicles like the half track on this page are not in 164 scale. In fact, they couldn't even be drawn to look in scale compared to the other vehicles on the page. You can get away with this and not having kids scratching their heads until you start molding people into the vehicles. There, the scale difference will pop out at you in a way that the vehicles without people don't. As such, most cars with people in them are at 164 scale, so the people match up in the correct scale. But eventually, Lesney will move away from having people in them altogether. Looking on through cars numbered 59 through 70, we get one more piece of art. This time a nice highway scene that reminds me of something you might see on a map of the same era. Again, all cars shown can be found in the catalog. Looking at the next page, I'll draw your attention to the grit spreader. I have a video where I restore this truck. I'll leave a link in the description if you would like to see that. Notice that the TV repair truck comes with several small TVs. You might have noticed several previous toys that come with small parts. These toys sort of predate the concern for choking hazards. Toys today might still have these items, but they'll be permanently attached or molded into the car so kids can't remove and swallow them. And here we come to the end of the Matchbox series with the last three models on the bottom of the page being new models for this year. And it just so happens I have a mint version of the cattle truck shown here with its swallowable cows still attached at the sprue. This is how they came from the factory. The child would need to remove the cows from the sprues before eating them. Anyway, that concludes the Matchbox series in this catalog. Let's see what else Lesney has in store for us for the rest of the catalog. For the next four pages, Matchbox explains how die-cast cars are made. You can pause the video to read through this, and I hope you do take the time because it's an interesting read. You'll need to back the video up if you wish to see everything in the correct order given the layout of the catalog. Very few of these production methods make it to today's manufacturing of die-cast cars. Computers have taken out all the guesswork, and it could be said a lot of the magic that Lesney's trying to sell you here. This is definitely a production line of the past. There are some interesting small tidbits you can glean from these images. You may notice all the technical roles are played by men, while the assembly and boxing roles are being done by women. Ironically, this is actually an example of what we call today virtue signaling. Post-World War II women were expected to relinquish their factory jobs for the men coming back from the war and take on their previous role of homemaker and secretaries and such. I think Lesney here is showing off its desire to hire women back into the factories. When they closed the factory, many women wrote into newspapers to give their gratitude to Lesney for employing them. You may also notice that besides a single pair of eyeglasses, nobody's wearing any safety protection to speak of. It was a different time. Next, we're moving into the gift sets. All I can really tell you about these is that they're extremely expensive to buy, especially if they're in good condition and come with their original packaging. 
These are the things your grandparents would buy for you for Christmas or your birthday. You typically would open them up and then throw everything away except for the toys. Most had a theme to them such as G2 which has a car hauler and the car haul. There are two play sets here which we'll see again later as they were sold just as play sets without any cars included. It's interesting as each gift set has its own art on it. That art had to be redrawn and scaled for this catalog and had to match the art on the box. Leslie must have kept a team of artists rather busy. Next we're getting into the major packs. These are vehicles much bigger than the Matchbox cars but smaller than the King size line. You could say these are the larger vehicles that are in the correct 164 scale or very close to 164. Many have features to them like the car hauler that hauls your Matchbox cars. With these vehicles you really could create a nice highway diorama that is very close to the correct scale. Now I only have a few of these and only one that I can get to easily to show here and it's the racing car transporter. Mine was actually sent in by a subscriber and it's in great shape. I just need to get a new tire for it or cast one from one of the other tires. It's also missing its back ramp but I could probably find that eventually on eBay. It will hold two cars inside but you do need to be careful as the top shelf will easily collapse onto the bottom scratching or chipping the paint on any car that you have there. As such I would never put mint cars in this. The other vehicle I own is the GMC tractor with hopper train however it's not really available for me to get easily. The car transporter you see here is on my short list of vehicles to get. This makes a great display piece as you can load them up with lots of Matchbox cars to display. Now we're getting into the Matchbox king size vehicles. I only have one of these and it happens to be in this catalog so you'll get to see it in a bit. King size and major packs are very close in scale and typically get confused with each other online. Many of the king size trucks have scales that are larger than 164 but some are really close so it depends on which vehicle you're looking at. A few of these trucks like the Hoveringham vehicle have smaller mainline twins while others are only made in the king size line. The example I own is the Dodge Tractor with twin tippers. This one was sent in by the same individual that sent in the race car transporter. Again it's missing tires and I'll have to replace them later. The rubber tires expand over the years and fall off. I can set a regular matchbox beside the truck and you can see that this scale is a bit off with the tractor being a tad too big or the car too small, but slightly off nonetheless. If you were a child playing with these, I am sure it didn't really matter. Outside of the main 164 scale line, I would say the king size line was the next most popular line over the course of Leslie's existence. However, there is a blip caused by the next series matchbox made, but first a quiz. This quiz is here, if I had to guess, to get the page count to work so they didn't have any blank pages. This is as good a place as any to stick it in. I reversed the answers so you didn't have to do a handstand in front of your computer. You're welcome. Please put in how many points you scored in the comments below. Alright, the Matchbox models of yesteryear. My understanding of this line was that it was primarily created for adult collectors and was extremely popular during most of its run. However, as time went on, the line became less and less popular. Today, most of these cars can be found in near mint condition for around $16 to $20, in many cases with the original box. Now, some are more popular than others, but on the whole, you can collect this line for a fraction of what it would cost to collect any other line. Now, my honest opinion as to why this is has to do with collecting in general. Adults collected these cars. They did not play with them, at most they just sat on shelves or in boxes that found their way into attics. As such, adults today that were kids back then have very little memory of them. Most collectors today collect what they had as a child and kids back in the day played with their toys. So many of the toys kids played with were destroyed, lessening the supply of the toys that would make it to the current day. However, models of yesteryear were treated as collectibles by adults at the time. So many of them have made it into the current year because they've been packed up in people's attics. But here's the thing, most kids didn't play with these, so few have any nostalgia for them. So Matchbox cars have low supply to a high demand while models of yesteryear have a high supply to a low demand. That's not to say that they're worthless by any means, certainly there are collectors getting in on a good deal. But for the most part they're not as sought out like the smaller Matchbox cars are. This next page showcases the playsets that were available from Lesney in 1966. Again, my only real knowledge of these is just how expensive they are to acquire. 
While the playsets are definitely neat, I have to say that this is the one area in the catalog where I take issue with the artist rendering the toy in a cartoon style. The playsets don't look like the art presented. The artists have placed the buildings in a real world with real people walking around and decorations in the windows. None of these are options in the real toy. I get they were trying to get those young imaginations moving, but they might have gone a bit too far here. That all being said, it's a really cool playset for the time. But again, it's super expensive. Plan on spending upwards of three to four hundred dollars on one of these in good condition. So the last item presented in the catalog is the Matchbox Roadways. These are printed on heavy weighted paper and the kids would have to cut out the bridges and buildings and tape them to the map. While a neat concept, I feel this would not hold most kids' attention nearly as long as the playsets. And like the playsets, the maps don't look nearly as nice as the art that represents them. And finally we reach the price guide. This is the American catalog and so the prices are in US currency. These toys were sold in all sorts of stores all over the US and were imported by Fred Broner Company of New York. I believe this is the original building listed at the address in the catalog, or at least it looks old enough to be it. Fred was a good friend of Rodney Smith, Rodney being one of the co-owners of Lesney along with Leslie Smith. They were not related, but the name Lesney comes from the first three letters of Leslie's name and the last three letters from Rodney's name or a portmanteau of their first names. Anyway, Fred seems to have been an interesting character. He ran Fred Bronor Company until Lesney decided to create their own U.S. division called Lesney Products U.S. They then bought out Fred Bronor Company and made Fred the first president of Lesley's U.S. division. I wasn't able to find out if he was still alive, though I don't believe he is, or what he did after working for Lesney, but what I did find was his name in a lot of lawsuits involving him in price-fixing Matchbox toys. It seems the toy market was pretty cutthroat back in the day and Fred was not afraid to make things happen if you decided to sell Matchbox toys at a greater than 20% off the listed price. It's a rabbit hole if you find the time. Just Google Fred Broner Corporation lawsuit and enjoy. So I wanted to end this video with the entire cover. Again, great artwork with great marketing of the toys. If you enjoyed this video, well then you know what to do. I think the next catalog will be in the 70s since many of these have the same models in them. By moving to the 70s we'll break into the super fast line and cars I remember playing with as a child. The only downside being that we're going to lose all the beautiful artwork. Anyway, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.